Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I am so glad that you are here. And I'd love for you to keep introducing yourself. I've seen so many people saying hello in the chat from everywhere, I, even from Dominican Republic, uh, Nicaragua, Norway, Canada, United States, Isle of Man. Hey, Janet. So really, really cool to see people coming in Egypt now from all over the world. Welcome, welcome. This is going to be a great deal of fun. I want to give you a little bit of uh, personal background just to give you a sense of why I'm here and why I'm doing this for you. And that is that I was once absolutely terrified of public speaking. Like you cannot even begin to know how that was for me. It was awful. And, uh, and of course, today I am so fortunate that I'm like getting to travel all over the world and I get to, uh, I get to speak for audiences in over 20 countries around the world and I get to live a really, really incredible life because I overcame those things. And it wasn't as simple as that for me. One thing I had to do is overcome my nervousness, but a big part of overcoming my nervousness was getting really good at presenting and constructing presentations. And so one of the things I get asked the most about is how I put talks together. How do I structure a talk so that I don't need to use any notes, so that I am able to be flexible with the time, so that I can deliver on a moment's notice? And that is what we're really gonna be here about. And some of you are here because you want to be professional speakers. Some of you want to speak, for example, uh, to support your existing business. You, you might want to, uh, um, you, might want, you might have a book you wanna sell. Maybe you're in politics and you're, you're looking to raise your platform. And I think what we've all seen is how incredibly powerful talks can be. How incredibly powerful it can be when somebody becomes effective at communicating and then gets that talk or gets that presentation out into the world. What an incredible, um, you know, boost that can be to whatever project it is they're focused on. So if you would like to develop a talk that can absolutely sort of propel you forward or launch whatever project you're working on, you're in the right place. This is what developing a signature talk is all about. All about. If you aren't really sure where to start, don't worry, you are at the right place for starting. If you've been watching TED Talks and you've noticed that some of them are really fantastic and some of them are not so much and you want to know how to make sure your, your TED Talk one day is truly fantastic, definitely you're in the right place. If you've ever written out a talk word for word and tried to memorize it and then deliver it, I'm so glad you're here. And, and of course, if you are an author or a business owner or anybody who wants to promote something other than yourself, like your book or your business, or you want to raise money or something, you're definitely in the right place. In fact, I would say that many of you, many of you are in a situation that means that you are truly one great presentation away from creating incredible transformation in your life and your business. So you're definitely in the right place. Now, we're gonna cover some fantastic stuff today that's gonna to help you to um, integrate the process that I use for creating a signature talk. The masterclass will run for about 90 minutes. And if you put your questions in the Q&A feature, you can, you can, there's a Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. If you put your questions in the Q&A area, then uh, my team is going to give those questions to me at the end so I can answer as many of your questions as I can. You should also make sure you've got your masterclass workbook with you. And yes, a replay of the masterclass will be sent out within 48 hours. And also, you want to make sure that you stay until the end. Um, you want to stay until the end to really, uh, there's going to be a very special opportunity to really understand even more about signature talks and how to build a career as a speaker or as somebody who wants to use speaking as a platform. So what you're going to learn um, is in a sense a five-step process. So you're going to learn how to kind of get clear about what we call your strategic outcome or even more accurately, your strategic outcomes. Because I believe that every time you say yes to a presentation, every time you start designing a presentation, and obviously every time you take the stage, whether it's in front of a camera or in front of an audience, you should have a number of outcomes that you're seeking to achieve. We're going to learn how to determine what those are. We're going to also show you how to organize your stories in a very effective way so that it's super easy for you to memorize your talks. You're going to learn about something that we call the F-15. And the F-15 is the powerful opening that you present with, that you start with, that you create your first impression with. And we're going to also learn about the L-15, and that is how to land your talk or how to end 
with strength, how to, how to have an incredibly strong close at the end of your presentation. And then of course, in step five, we're gonna put the entire process together in what we call a speech map so that you never ever have to write out one of your talks again. So are you excited about that so far? Anybody excited? I'd love to see in the chat. By the way, I watch the chat. So if you guys write in there a lot, I'll, I'll see what's going on. Look at this, even Estonia now, they're from everywhere. Okay, look at that. I'm super glad to see you guys are excited. I am too. All right, so let's talk about what a signature talk is going to be. Um, a signature talk is really a presentation that you have designed that achieves strategic objectives for you. It is not a speech or a sales presentation per se. It is a talk that you can become known for. It's, it's, it's a talk where people could go, wow, they hire you or they book you or they request you because that talk was so compelling. So why is that important? Well, there's a number of issues. The one is it allows you to get your message out consistently. In other words, it's not that you do the exact same talk every single time. It's that every single time you do it, you're learning and it's getting better and better, but the core structure is consistent, so your message is consistent. The other thing is the signature talk makes you look professional, even if you're not. And so what it means is that when you finish a talk like that, people come along and they'll walk up to you and say, can you do that talk for my organization? Because they, they begin to think about the talk as a product of its own, something that they themselves think is fascinating that you'd want to work with, that they'd want to book. It also, when you learn how to create a signature talk, what's really great is that you learn that you can create signature level presentations on a moment's notice once you've got this system. That means that you could be at an event and somebody says, hey, I need you to walk up on stage right now. And if you're given like even five minutes, you'll know the formula behind how you can create a really compelling talk. One of the most popular talks that I've ever done was no kidding, created in the hours before I went on stage to deliver it. But that's because I had this formula that you're gonna have. It also will show you how to be able to sell really effectively. And by sell, what I mean is this, influence. So selling might be that you are attempting to um, uh, convince people to buy something or invest in something or vote for you. Isn't that a form of sales? So it's about being able to really consistently and accurately influence people. It also helps you to get booked uh, on interviews, podcasts, and media. And, and naturally, it creates a platform for you to promote whatever it is that you're trying to do. Maybe you've got a business to promote, a book to promote, and an, a cause that you're supporting. Whatever that is, the ability to deliver a really powerful signature presentation can completely set you apart and help you to achieve your goals. And as I said before, right now, many of you are one talk away from everything it is that you've wanted to create. And I'm gonna give you some evidence of that because at this point, I imagine that many of you have heard of Simon Sinek. And what happened in Simon Sinek's case is that Simon Sinek went off and did a TED Talk. And when he did his TED Talk, the TED Talk, um, guys, I've lost the slides on my screen. I'm just speaking to my team there for a minute. I'm not sure why that is. But anyway, when he went off to do uh, the TED Talk, the TED Talk became really, really popular. It was all about start with why. And the next thing you know, it led to additional, um, it led to additional uh, uh, bookings. It led to, um, it, it, it led to uh, uh, being invited to do a book and he built an entire industry out of it. Now, one really powerful talk created an entire, now I'm not suggesting he didn't have a bunch of experience and life experience and so on, but that talk ultimately created an industry in a sense. Some of you at this point are probably familiar also with Brené Brown. Uh, she's recently released a, um, a special on Netflix and if you haven't seen it yet, I really highly recommend that you check out that, uh, the, the Netflix special. You will see some incredible storytelling really um, compelling presentation and it will it just it's really really a special but let's start let's start with this where did it begin it began with a ted talk and and by the way what's really funny is it began with a ted talk that she didn't that she even apparently tried to get turned off like she was like i i don't I don't know that I really want to be doing that. <laughs> like, get it off because it's getting all this attention. And the way she tells the story, she's like, uh, uh, you know, she looked online and it's like, oh, look, oh, no, five people have seen it. And, and what, what bothered her about it is that the talk was different than the one she'd only done. She, she got out there and she started talking about vulnerability. And all of a sudden, wow, how vulnerable was she? She said, they took this talk on vulnerability and made it public. And she's looking at it. And the way she tells the story, she's like, I was looking at it. It was like, there were five people. 
that saw it, and then six people, and then 12 people, and then 5 million people, and then 7 million people. And that has in turn launched an incredible career for her as well, books and speaking gigs and so on. In fact, we tried years ago to get her to book her for um, uh, one of the events that we were doing in Europe. And when we went to go to book her, it was like almost impossible. It, never mind the fees that were incredible. We're talking six figure fees, like the same with Simon Sinek. We were at a place where it was just schedule wise. She was just simply picking and choosing the types of engagements she wanted. And that's because she'd created such an incredible platform for herself. So I just, I want you to know that, and, and, and very often what happens here for people is that they feel like, wow, I, I've got a message, I've got a purpose, I've got a product I want to promote, I have a book I want to get out there, but I just, I don't really know how to do it. And as I said to you before, I think very, very much the case is that you can be one talk away from incredible, incredible results. So let's talk about the way this masterclass is going to work. The first thing I want to remind you is that you should have your masterclass workbook. So uh, we sent that out to you as a PDF. You should have your masterclass workbook and you want to have that ready with you. The other thing is, is that you have, at this point, uh, you were given a homework assignment or given a link to go and watch my talk on the hindsight window uh, that you can find on YouTube. And the reason I wanted to, to take a look at that talk is we're going to talk a little bit about how that talk was created. And then I'm going to give you just some points about that talk so that you can understand how the talk was created and, um, and, and why it worked the way it worked and how you can do those same things. But there's one thing I want to say to you. I really want you to hear me about this as well. Some of you probably watch a talk like that or Simon Sinek or any number of incredible talks. And you're like, yeah, but I couldn't be as good as that. And I want you to know you're wrong. You're really wrong. I, I really want you to know that, and I'm not the one usually to walk around and tell people they're wrong, but about that, if you feel that way, you're wrong. And what I mean is, is that when you understand this formula that we're showing you today and you begin to practice it and use it effectively, what you're going to realize is that what audiences really want is you. They just want the authentic you. And if you think about it, if you think about it, the, the speakers that really speak to your heart, I'm not talking about the ones that hype you up and make you feel good. That's great too. It's good stuff. But I'm talking about the ones that connect with you when you feel a sense of connection with them. Like if you saw them in an airport, you'd feel compelled to walk up because you feel like you know them. Aren't they the ones that were just the most authentic? Aren't they the ones that felt like they were just talking to you personally? And so really the way you want to be fabulous as a speaker is just simply being you. And so for those of you who've watched The Hindsight Window, I want to give you a little bit of background on how that happened. I had been invited by uh, Mind Valley, who is a large digital publisher of really great personal development content and um, educational content around the world. And they run an incredible annual event. And they asked me to come and speak there. And I was a last minute booking by the founder. And so they didn't really have a lot of time to fit me into the schedule. I flew out to this event in Mykonos, Greece. And I did my 20 minute presentation, you know, Ted, a Ted, a Ted style time frame. And I did my presentation and Vishen Lakiani, the founder of Optic, came up to me at dinner that night and he said, wow, our tribe just loved your presentation. Could you do another one? Now, what he didn't know is up to that point in time, that was the first time I'd ever agreed to speak for 20 minutes. In fact, I had turned down every TED invite I'd ever had because I didn't, oh man, like preparing for a 20 minute talk, I had this limiting belief. Even then, as an established and professional speaker, I had this limiting belief that, you know, it would take me like a few hours to put together a two hour presentation, but it would take me weeks to put together a 20 minute presentation. You know, there's that old Mark Twain, uh, you know, that old Mark Twain reference that, I'm sorry this letter is so long. I, if I'd had more time, it would have been shorter. And, and, and very often that's how I felt about presentations. But that night when Vishen came up to me and he said, hey, could you do another one? I, I just said, no problem. And I used the formula that I'm going to show you today. And I used that formula in my hotel room and I designed the hindsight window talk. So for those of you who watched it on YouTube, I'm hoping many of you did. I want you to understand I had never done it before. I had never practiced it. I'd never even thought of it before. I designed it that night. Now, clearly the ideas are things I've given a lot of thought to. Clearly the ideas are things I've given a lot of thought to, but the talk was brand new, designed the night before using the formula I'm gonna show you. And so there's a couple things that I wanna highlight for you about that, that each, I want you to pay attention as we go through each of the steps, and I want you to notice 
where you feel like those things happen in the hindsight window because it's put together exactly using the formula I'm using. And I want you to know that when you begin to get this stuff, when you, when you create these things and what is available to you is an entire audience because you see 15 or 20 years ago, if you wanted to get out there into the world, you needed somebody to say yes to you. You needed some producer or editor or you needed some agent or somebody to agree to get you in the media. But today, you just need to be amazing. And, and it's not that difficult because it means being authentic because today you can upload a video and take a look here. I mean, we just yesterday uh, found out that this video has gone up to over 2 million views. Today, you can simply be authentic and people can resonate with you. You no longer need the gatekeeper's permission. You can be a publishing phenomenon of your own in whatever space you want to be in. You're one talk away. So, and, and in fact, what's really interesting about this is that as we got clearer and clearer about how this stuff worked, we found that it translated into all kinds of different areas. So the formula I'm going to use, show you here actually works really well for any of you who are interested in talking for cameras or creating digital media product. In fact, uh, at the Mind Valley Awards the, uh, ceremony this year in Los Angeles, I won an award for the highest customer rated training program on their entire platform. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Our, 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 our program that won the award is called WildFit. It's a health and nutrition program. That's one of the hardest genres to get high ratings in. I think you could agree. There's lots of meditation programs and you know Jim Quick's doing his memory. There's some fabulous programs on there. To get the highest rating on a topic like diet and nutrition is incredibly challenging. And the things you're gonna learn on this workshop here are gonna show you how we made that happen. So, are you guys ready? I hope you are. Let's get started. Make sure you've got your workbook with you that you're ready to go and, uh, and we'll get into the steps so you really um, uh, get this stuff happen. So, one of the things that's really clear to me about everything in your life is intention. This is probably not new to many of you. I just want to say it again. Intention. So I'll give you a small example of this. These days, if your phone rings, why do you answer it? Well, I, I'm going to put to you that very often these days, people's, their, their strategic objective for answering the phone is to stop it from ringing or vibrating, right? Like, they say, oh, it's ringing, and they answer it. But one of the things that I think can be really amazing is what if you change that? And the strategic objective becomes to let the person know that you really care about them. So now what happens is the phone rings and your wife, your husband, your child, your best friend, somebody important is on there. Instead of it being about ending the ringing, when you answer the phone, what if your strategic objectives communicate love and communicate connection? Do you think that might change your tone of voice? Do you think it might change the energy with which you answer the phone just by shifting your intention a little bit? And so now, what I want you to think about is at a higher level, what if we do that in preparing our talks? And so the exercise here is about determining what your strategic objectives are. So if you look in the workbook, you'll see a slide, you'll see a page like this slide, where you do an exercise to determine what your objectives are when you go on stage. Now this, by the way, will set you apart from almost any other presenters because frankly, most people, even highly paid professional speakers, go on stage with one or two objectives, to get paid, to impress the audience, maybe to make them laugh, like to get through it, to survive the presentation. I've heard some pretty interesting ones. What I wanna suggest is that what we're gonna do is create for you the maximum opportunities to succeed by having a number of different strategic objectives so that when you are clear about your objectives, it will help you to know which talks to agree to do, how to structure your talk, how to build a signature talk, and also which stories to use and how to deliver it. And that's what your strategic objectives are about. So you can see on the workshop here, we've decided, divided your strategic objectives into, um, into two categories, primary objectives and secondary objectives. So here's what I want you to think about. And what I'd like to see in the chat right now is what are some of the strategic objectives that you might have getting on stage or standing in front of a camera and delivering a talk? What are some of the strategic objectives you might have? Throw, throw them in the chat and I'm, I'm going to talk through some of the ideas. So what I'm thinking about here in terms of how to help you get clear about what strategic objectives are is think about it this way. Wouldn't it be nice if this happened? 
wouldn't it be nice if that happened? So for example, sometimes strategic objectives might be things like, oh, it would be really cool if someone invited me to do an interview on their podcast. That's an interesting strategic objective. How about another one is to get rebooked? I, I, want, to, I want to get rebooked me to speak again. That was one of my strategic objectives when I did the hindsight window. And incidentally, I have spoken at something like five of the last six or seven AFEST events by Mind Valley because one of my objectives was to get rebooked. Another strate strategic objective might be to get booked by others because there might be people in the audience that host events or uh, organize corporate events or what have you. And so you might want to get booked by them. Um, how about uh, like, um, how many of you have a book you want to write? Could one of your strategic objectives be to land a book dealer to get an agent, right? Um, I, I see a lot of people saying, have an impact, have influence. What I want you to do, Nina, that's excellent. What I want you to do is solidify that. What does it actually mean? Does it mean to actually pull in followers to your Instagram account? Because I want you to be more specific of the strategic objective. Here's an example. Let's say you realize that one of your strategic objectives is to get followers for your Instagram account. Well, if you know that that's one of your strategic objectives, do you think that might affect the way you design your slides or the way you tell stories, right? Because you might, because you know you want to get Instagram followers, then that might, in, that might influence you to drop in a quick little story about how you, oh yeah, I was on Instagram the other day and this crazy thing happened to me on the airplane. And so I told the story. I did this the other day, funny enough, and I told this really funny story on Instagram. Well, now I'm telling you that, and now you might go, oh, I should go follow Eric on Instagram. So you see, when you know the strategic objective specifically, it can begin to inform the type of stories you tell. Very important. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna look at some more of yours. So Anders, I love it that the audience loves you. That's fantastic. In this case, what I want you to do is aim for actual objectives, measurable things that you know if it really happened. So in your case, Anders, when you say you want the audience to love you, how could that show up in a tangible way? In other words, it does it mean that you attracted followers? Does it mean that lots of people wanted to come and get autographs and photographs with you? I don't think of it in, a, in terms of a tangible way. Um, Arena she says, hey, I want to become a leader in my field. That's excellent. That is a great strategic objective. What it means is that you want to become like a, a, a key influencer in your industry. That's excellent. Knowing that is going to influence the way you do your talk. Because if you want to become a key influencer, you're going to have to have statistics and information. It's going to make you want to be really credible. Uh, yes, Rusty, definitely rebooked. Um, Tommy says, I want to transform people's sex life. Well, yes, I think that's a great strategic objective. It is. And what I want you to think about is that might be in the theme of the overall presentation you're doing because you want to like transform their, their sex life now in your presentation. But is there an action you want them to take? Are you trying to get them to enroll in a program, buy a book, go on a retreat? So always with your strategic objectives, try to get to like a measurable thing that you, you would, when it happened, you would go, yes, I know that I achieved what it is that I meant to achieve. And so once you've, let's see, a couple more here. Okay, now I see quite a lot of um, sort of, let's call them a little bit more esoteric strategic objectives. Like I see one here from Igar, to offer new perspectives on personal development. This is more of a theme and it, yes, it can be your strategic objective. What I'm after here is, is it, like I said, a specific and measurable thing that if they did this thing, you got this result and you knew it. So if you try to get clearer about that, and it, it, when you get clear on the specificity, it will help you to choose your structure a lot better. So for example, um, let's see here, uh, Naomi says, ultimately to sell my course, but along with that, create a community of expert entrepreneurs who understand how to select the right marketing strategy for their business. Okay, so what no Naomi's really saying is she wants to sell her course, but she also wants to build community. So then the question happens, now has to be more specific. Well, what does build community mean? Does it mean get followers? Does it mean get them to sign up for a membership site? It, it, you know, like what does it actually mean in a tangible sense beyond simply reputational? All right, so these are some great, wow, you guys have some excellent ones. Hey, uh, uh, Marius, Mar oh, sorry, Mari Lee says to get them to download my ebook. That's really important. You put that in there as one of your strategic objectives because that will make sure to remind you to offer it or to integrate it into a slide. Here's the way I want you to think about this, guys. How many of you, have ever gone to the grocery store without a list? Oh, how about this, even worse. You've gone to the grocery store without a list while you were hungry, <laughs> right? Like, you know, first of all, you end up with a whole lot of stuff you didn't need or didn't want, and you end up with a whole lot of stuff that you didn't pick up. 
that you meant to get and you get home and you're like, ah, if only I took a list. Well, your strategic objectives list is kind of like your shopping list for being on stage. And so by getting really clear about what these items are, you will cut down the number of times you walk off stage and go, oh, I wish I'd said that. So that's what this is all about. What I'd like you to do is take a look at creating your own strategic objectives list and then prioritizing them. That means you have three primary objectives. You, th these are your main reasons for doing this presentation. So if it's a sales presentation, you, if you, you got to know that you're going to have to have a good presentation and a good call to action to get them to take action. And so you know that it's one of your primary objectives. If one of your primary objectives is to um, get them to uh, say download your ebook, then you're definitely going to want to make sure you've got a good story in there. You've got a good slide. You've got the URL is really clear. You want to make it as easy for them as possible and integrate it right into your presentation. But then you might have a series of secondary objectives. And um, I'll give you a really great example. Let's always have secondary objective of getting invited for media interviews because I'm speaking in so many different countries around the world that I know that getting a media invitation here in Sweden or then I'm in Florida now or I'm in wherever, it's really useful to get those invitations. So that's become one of my secondary objectives almost anytime I'm on stage. Well, this is really important because what it means is, and I've noticed the difference, is that when I get on the stage, when I get on the stage and I start talking about stuff, well, I'll, I will often drop in a story about this one time that I was in Stockholm and this woman wanted to do a podcast with me, but I, I, I was like so tight for time, I could only give her 15 minutes. And so I, I gave her 15 minutes, we did the podcast, and it was so good. It was so interesting. It was so fascinating. I mean, I, she was such a good interviewer, I really wished that I could have done it for longer. And that made me decide that from then on, when I go and do events in a city, I will always leave an extra day to do interviews for that sort of stuff. And you know what was really great about that is only about two months later, that same woman found out that I was going to be speaking in Italy. She came there and I was able to have the hour long interview with her. It was really fantastic. So I'll often you tell that story at some point in the presentation. Well, what's going on? Anybody in the audience with a podcast or a blog or from mainstream media hears that. They suddenly go, oh, Eric builds time for that stuff in. And oh, by the way, he's approachable. And so guess what? When I remember to include that story in my presentation in some way, I get all the invites. When I forget, I get a lot less. So getting your strategic objectives in there can be really, really powerful. Now, if you think about it from the hindsight window that you guys took a look at, in the hindsight window, I had a number of strategic objectives there. My primary two strategic objectives were to get rebooked and to get published on the Mind Valley platform. How many of you guys would like to have a product that you could get published on a platform like Mind Valley, right? So they were two of my biggest strategic objectives. So what ended up happening was I had to make sure that the talk was constructed in a way that would absolutely make them want to rebook me. So it had to be entertaining, make people laugh and give a ton of value. So it informed the way I stru structured that presentation. But also I had to put the possibility in that talk that showed that I was good at facilitating transformation. And so I designed the talk to be able to demonstrate that skill. And as a consequence, I got rebooked and got published on the platform. So, Getting your strategic objectives clear before you even say yes to a presentation can absolutely transform everything about your business. And I saw somebody asking there, well, shouldn't we do this for all talks? There it is. Uh, shouldn't we do this for all talks, not just for signature presentations? Yes, absolutely. Here's the difference. With your signature presentation, what you're going to recognize is that you're going to have a list of strategic objectives, but they might change slightly each time you deliver the talk depending on who the audience is. But yes, this is something that I go through for every talk I create, whether I'm planning to create an anchor signature talk or I'm just doing a one-off, I still wanna go through my strategic objectives. Great question. All right, once we've done our strategic objectives, then, well, this is important. You see, stories are the key to everything. Stories are the primary programming language of the brain. The single best way for humans to learn anything is to do stuff. And the second best way for us to learn is to do stuff in our imagination. In other words, if you want to train a young hunter-gatherer child on hunting, well, when he's three or four or five years old, not really big enough yet to go out on the hunting trip. So you can't really teach him yet. But around the fire, you can. 
because by the time that child is 11 or 12 years old and old enough to go on the first hunting trip, that child has been hearing stories and stories and stories about hunting. And so that child is already in an incredibly smart and experienced hunter, having never been on a hunting trip. Stories are the primary way that our ancestors have been passing knowledge to each other for hundreds of thousands of years. And so as a result of that, our brain is particularly receptive to stories. And that's why if you think back now to any of the teachers you had as a student that really made an impression on you, that you still know their names, that you'd love to go and have lunch with them and tell them what a great teacher they were. If you really think about it, I think you'll find they were storytellers. And so I want to show you that you too can be a phenomenal storyteller. And the way you do that is by recognizing that every event of your life that caused you to have an emotional response is a story. You might not know the value of the story. You might not know the value of the story, but the audience will. And you will figure out what the value of that story is when you've got clear about your strategic objectives. The key thing though is, is not to simply rely on your memory. You want to keep a story journal. And so we've given you a template here of what the story journal looks like. Now, I want you to know, I already saw somebody asking, hey, can we do this online? Can we do it with something like Evernote? Yes, you can. I highly recommend that you start with paper and get the system down in a proper journal. And so you take out your journal, you get your journal, and you, and you keep each page for a story, much like we've done here. Every story should have a title right? Every story should have a title. And, and that's really great. You just, it just should be a catchy title so that you, when you're thinking about putting your talk together, you go, oh, I can add this story to that story to this story. And you're just using the titles. It's just a little short inventory, you know, name for that story. Then you write out the bullet points of the story, just the bullet points. You never actually write the story out unless you're writing a book or something that's a different issue but in terms of preparing to deliver a talk online or on stage or something never write the stories out just the bullet points the key aspects of the story so for example when i took a look at telling you guys the story in um uh there's a story in there that i told about road rage you guys remember about road rage and the story in my story journal is called white van man now, White Van Man is a reference that anybody from England would totally understand. I, I lived in England for a long time, and so I used that title because it reminds me of the story. But the story is about a guy driving a truck, you know, with no company name on it, no phone number to call, and being abusive in traffic. And those guys in England are called White Van Man. And so the whole story, if, I, if I'm putting in a story journal, the title is White Van Man, then the bullet points are... I'm driving along in my convertible. It's a sunny day in England. I put a little asterisk there because if you're talking to English people and you know it's a sunny day in England, you know there's a laugh to be had there because you can go, yeah, it was about five years ago. It was a sun you probably remember. It was a Thursday. It was sunny because it's the only time it's been sunny in five years. You know, a little, little, you know, it's a little bit of a joke you can put in there. You little asterisk that you know you've got a joke to tell there. And, and then the next bullet point is the guy in the white truck pulled up beside me and then he said this and I said that. And it's just kind of the bullet points of the story, right? And so... Then I put the duration in the top right hand corner. In other words, how long does it tell me, how long does it take me to tell that story? Well, that story, I can tell it in a short in about three or four minutes, like I think it was in the hindsight window talk. But if I'm using it as a training example, there's about a 15 minute version of that story where I can really break it down step by step. So we've got the title and the duration and the bullet points. And then um, what I'll often do is I'll also create a, um, a, a little story map, a little like a map of the story. And we'll get to that more when we talk about speech maps. Now, in the bottom of the page, it's really important to have what I call topic tags. And, um, and what the topic tags are is single word or phrase references to what, to, to what that story is about or how that story might be useful. So in the case of White Van Man, that story, I might have the topic tags be traffic, road rage, um, let's see, state management, um, you know, those kinds of things. Why? Because now when I've got my story journal laid out like that, I can, um, when I've got that uh, a story journal done like that, what it means is, is that I can now leaf through the bottom of the pages and I can see all the story tags. I can see all the story tags and it's, it's like awesome. It's just like I can put the talk together. I go, oh, you know what? I'd love to tell a story about how to manage your state of mind. Oh, look. Oh, I've got that story right here. Managing your state of mind. Oh, the road rage story. White van man. Boom. Off I go. 
And so you fill your journal with all the different stories like this, even, listen to me, even when you don't know how the story might be useful to you. You guys will also know from the hindsight window, my Playero story. The Playero story is about the time that Elise and I came back from six months of touring on the road, speaking all over the world, building schools in Africa, just having a fantastic six months, but having almost all of our possessions with us and then having them all stolen from us on our way home. The Playero story. Well, here's what's really great about that story. When it was happening, I had no idea how you, where that story would be useful. I was like, it was a horrible event. It was difficult. And, and then, you know what? I got through it and so on. And the next thing you know, that story has become an incredibly valuable way to teach the principles of state management or the principles of the hindsight window. And so in my story journal, it says, play our story, bullet points to the story, been on tour, got back, all stuff stolen, asked myself these questions, got myself okay. Within 10 minutes, I was fine. Then I was able to help my wife go through the same thing and so on. Duration of that story, I can tell it in about five minutes or there's like more like a 30 minute version of it. If I'm doing like a relationships or couples types uh, seminar, there's a different version of the story that I would tell. Same facts, but slightly different version of the story. And then the topic tags. Uh, well, in that case, again, state management, hindsight window, uh, uh, theft, um, criminals, all that kind of stuff in the references because now it makes it really, really easy for me to remember the story in a heartbeat and it makes it really easy for me to put stories together. So that's how we populate a story journal. It is really important for you to remember that your stories, your stories might not seem so incredibly valuable to you, but they will be to somebody else. Some of you might be familiar with one of my favorite mentors, Jim Rohn. Jim Rohn was also the guy who kind of inspired Tony Robbins in the early days. Jim Rohn was a very, very interesting guy. And I remember hearing him say this one day, he was on stage and he, and he looked out at the audience and he says, he goes, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. And he goes, I, I just want you guys to know that I am well aware that every single one of you out there in the audience, your life experience and your stories are every bit as valuable as mine. And the only reason I'm up here is because this is my seminar. And I know that I would absolutely be intrigued and enthralled to be sitting in the audience, listening to your life experience too. And the first time I heard him say that, I was probably 24 or 25 years and I thought, oh, that's catchy. And I would get into my 30s before I realized it was sincere. It was legitimately sincere. And of course, the more people that I've worked with in over 20 countries around the world, I've realized every single person on earth has unbelievable, valuable stories for me and for you and for everybody else. What they need to do is find a way to tell them effectively. And that's what this is all about. You start off with your story journal. If you had an event in your life and it caused an emotional response, you were in a story. Write it in the journal, even if right now you don't even know how it might be valuable because I'm telling you one day it'll be valuable. Incidentally, I'll show you in a while as we go through here how you use your story journal to put your talks together. I just want you to think about this. How many of you have a book you'd like to write or another book you'd like to write? Don't you think it would be really helpful to have an entire journal full of your stories? Think about that. It's an incredibly powerful asset. If this is the only thing you take away from this masterclass, this masterclass has already been worth $5,000 to you. I'm telling you from my own experience, the story journal can absolutely transform your life. Now, I wanna to touch very briefly on how you might do this electronically. You, what I suggest is you'll notice there's a circle in our template, there's a circle in the bottom right hand corner. What that circle is, is an indicator of whether you've transferred it to your electronic brain or not. So in my case, I use Evernote. You could use OneNote, you could use Google Documents. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. I happen to like Evernote. And what that means is that once I've put it in Evernote, I just put a tick in that circle. What that means is I know that it's been transferred over to Evernote, so it's backed up in case I ever lose my journal or any of that kind of stuff. So it means that it's been transferred over. I still like to record them in a paper journal. But once I've transferred them to Evernote, then I put the tick there. The great news about putting them in Evernote is really fabulous is that when you want to do a search on a topic, you don't have to flick through your journal and look at the bottom tags. You just go, I want to tell a story about state management and all of the stories you've ever put in there about state management come up. And now it's just like unbelievably easy to put your talks together. So I hope that that has been useful for you. Please get your story journal out. What we're going to do next is maybe even more important than that. And it's something that we call the F-15 or the launch of your talk, the launch of your talk. Now, 
And the reason we call it the F15 is it's a metaphor. And it's a metaphor for the first 15% of your talk or the first 15 minutes, depending on how long you're speaking. And the metaphor is, of course, the F-15 fighter plane. The F-15 fighter plane can use, um, as on a short sortie, on a short flight, it can use as much of half of its petrol, half of its jet fuel, I should say, to just get into liftoff, half. And then the other half to fly around and land. And so I want you to think of that metaphor in that I would like you to think of this. After we've created your signature presentation and you're getting ready to go out there in the world and deliver, what I want you to think about is if you were to put half of your effort into the launch, how much easier would, be, how would the rest of the presentation be? Here's something I'd be curious about in the comments. How many of you had the experience where you're a little nervous, you're a little unsure, and then you walked onto stage and you, um, and you just said the right things at the beginning and you triggered a bit of a laugh and you got people going and you felt better because of that. How many of you have had that experience? Right, well, let's not do that by accident. Let's do it intentionally, right? Let's create an F-15 intentionally that is clinical, that's scientific, that's tested and proven so that when you walk onto a stage, you know exactly how you're going to begin. You know you're going to trigger the beginning you want and it's going to make the rest of your flight or your presentation really, really easy because you've already got liftoff. So here are some keys, some strategies that you can employ in designing really good F-15s. One that I recommend is having what we would call a funny little icebreaker. A cute little talk, a cute little joke, a cute little, um, you know, a nice little what we would call an F-15 story. Uh, you know, I'll give you a, a favorite example of mine I used recently where I said, I, mean, these, I got to this event and it was on the beach and so on. And, and I go, wow, I was out on the beach this morning. And, um, and I saw this couple coming down the beach and they had a dog with them and the dog ran ahead of them. And the dog ran up to, to, to me and my wife and it was barking. It was like barking, but it was weird. It had this like, it was like going, arr, arr. It's, it's, it's like the, it's voice box. They were saying it had laryngitis. I'd never heard of a dog with laryngitis before. And when the old couple caught up to the dog and we were there, we we're like, oh, is this your dog? It's such a sweet dog. Yeah, yeah. And we said, what's wrong? Does he have a bit of a cold? Like I've never heard of a dog that, and, and, the, and the wife, she's like, she's like, oh no, we, we had him debarked. What? We, we had him debarked. It's a surgery. We, you know, we could never train him to stop barking. So we just had his voice box removed. <gasps> I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. I, I couldn't believe it. I turned to the husband. And I go, are you okay with this? And he went, I don't have an opinion. Ha ha ha. Funny, funny. So, but I use that as a little bit of an icebreaker at the front end of a presentation because it, it creates a funny little anecdote, gets a bit of a giggle, a little bit of a, uh, uh, um, a little bit of a laugh. Some of you will have heard me tell a story about, uh, uh, Tony Robbins introducing me at an event and there was a translation issue and instead of telling people that I sold my business after nine years of owning it, he told the entire audience that I started my first business when I was only nine years old, right? So I tell that story as a fun little icebreaker. The idea is to have something cute and funny at the front end that kind of breaks the ice with people. Now, you might be doing a talk in an environment where maybe humor isn't the most appropriate thing. It's still some kind of icebreaker to get people comfortable. There are other exercises that you can do that uh, you, you know, like uh, you've seen a speaker walk out and go, okay, everybody turn to your partner and tell them why you're here. Well, even that can be a fun little icebreaker to break the tension in the room. Uh, engaging questions can be really useful. You can ask, well, how many people have seen me speak before? How many people have never seen me speak? And, uh, you know, that kind of stuff to try to get, just get them interactive a little bit. But if you, if you have some real fun with it, then you might, um, you might do like my friend Bruce Music did. He, he spoke at one of, our, uh, one of our speaking academy programs recently. And he, and he stood up and he goes, how many of you guys are here because you, you're, uh, you're, you know, you really lost, you want to know where to begin. And how many of you want to be truly fantastic as a speaker? And how many of you simply want to learn how not to suck when you, you know, it was so funny and everybody busted out laughing. It was a great little icebreaker. It only took 10 seconds. So funny, engaging questions can be useful. Another key point of an ice of the F-15, I believe is doing something that we call the big fat claim. And what this is, is a recognition that your audience, look, they've taken a risk, haven't they? I mean, they're sitting in the room, they're sitting in the room, they've invested their money, maybe, or maybe it's some kind of conference, but they certainly they're investing their time. And 
In fact, I'd like a little quick impromptu poll in the chat. How many of you have ever been to a conference or presentation and suddenly realized you were trapped in one of the middle seats and you're thinking, oh my God, I hope this next presentation isn't terrible. How many of you have been in that situation, right? And so, well, yeah, that happens. And so what we wanna do is recognize, hey, you know, like there's people in the, yeah, I see a lot of you have been there. And, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's funny, I've had so many people come up to me when they'd never heard of me or what have you, and they walk up and go, I was sitting there, I was ready to bolt, I was sitting on the aisle, I was ready to leave, but you kept me in the room, right? Well, that's what you wanna do is you wanna keep in the room. Well, one of the ways, <laughs> yeah, Danielle, I know your type. You sit at the back, ready to escape. My goal is to keep you from escaping. And one of the ways that I'm going to keep you from escaping is by making a big fat, big fat claim at the beginning of the presentation that tells you what you're going to get by being here, that assures you and gives you certainty that you're in the right place at the right time. Go back to the hindsight window talk, guys. Watch how I did this. I walked on stage. And it was a very casual event. I think I'm barefoot even. I'm in shorts and I walk up on stage and I say this, something like this. I don't remember the word for word, but I, I say something like this. I'm really glad you're here for this presentation because I'm pretty sure this is a talk that you're going to remember for years to come. <laughs> that, that, like, that does not make me sound nervous, does it? It makes the audience go, wow. Now there are some people in the audience who might go, that's a bit arrogant, but they're still in. And a lot of them mostly are going, wow, that sounds interesting. I've engaged them. I've got their attention. I also like to acknowledge them. I like to acknowledge the audience. And I'm not so into thanking the audience for being there, but I like to acknowledge them. And by the way, I particularly like to acknowledge people like Danielle or people who, like uh, uh, Thomas, who books himself in the aisle seats, right? I like to acknowledge those people. And the way I'll often do that is I'll say, you know what? I really appreciate that you guys are here. And I want you to know that I am myself have many times been sitting in the audience and I have been, just like you are, nervous about whether this presentation was gonna be great or not. In fact, I know that many of you are sitting in the aisle right now or at the back row, ready to make your escape. But I'm telling you here now, you won't wanna escape. You're gonna be glad you were here. And the weirdest thing is when you say that, you can actually see the audience relax. Because they, it's like, honestly, Guys, it's, I've never kind of explained it this way before, but think about it. Imagine if you got on the plane, right? And, and, and the airline attendant gets on the plane and they're all like, well, um, uh, I'm a bit nervous about this. Um, um, I'm hoping the flight's gonna work out okay, right? Like, no, they, they go up there and they talk with certainty and that relaxes the audience. And that's exactly what you want to do is go up there, acknowledge that they, that they acknowledge that they're in jeopardy and acknowledge that they've invested their time and money and then make the big fat claim to let them know that you're going to deliver for them. And then, of course, interactive warm up exercises can be fantastic. Like I mentioned, turn to your partner, say hello. Why are you guys here? All that kind of stuff can really, really um, help a great deal with putting a good F-15 together. So those are some strategies for building a good F-15. Just to recap. A funny little icebreaker, by the way, in your story journal, when something cute and funny happens or you hear a funny joke or what have you, you put it in the story journal and in the tags, you write F15. Now, it doesn't mean you only use it in the F15, but it means that when you're getting ready to create an F15, you can look through your journal or search through Evernote and immediately find any of your stories that qualify as a cute and funny F15 story. So you want a little funny icebreaker. You want to have engaging questions, maybe to get them started with you, depending on the environment. Uh, you want to do a big fat claim to calm them, give them some acknowledgement, and, and maybe potentially put some kind of interactive warm-up exercise just to get the room going. Again, this depends a little bit on the context. If you are doing a TED Talk, I'm not such a big fan of using too many engaging questions and interactive exercises in a TED Talk. You only have 20 minutes, but you can figure out which features you want to include in your F-15. All right, so once you've got a good F-15, you're gonna be able to fly. And after you've been flying for a while, you're gonna to need to land. And that's what we call the L-15. Now, it's really important that you know where to land. Think about it, you're in a plane. Is it important to know where you're gonna land? I think so. And also how to land. Now, how many of you have ever seen a, um, how many of you have ever seen a speaker go oh, like over time, really awkwardly over time? Have any of you ever seen this? Yeah. So, <laughs> yes, I mean it. Disgusting is a little strong. I happen to agree with you. I think going over time is one of the most disrespectful things that a speaker can do. 
It is disrespectful to the promoter. It's disrespectful to the audience. And it's also, even more than any of the others, disrespectful to the other speakers. And so it's absolutely not a good idea. Yes, I, yes, I mean, I know you were looking for disrespectful. So close to disgusting. Very close. So the point, though, is, is that one of the reasons that people often go over time is that they didn't have an L15. They didn't really know how they were going to end. And so they got toward the ending and they're like, oh, I don't really know how to end. And, they, and it starts getting clumsy and they start circling the airport because they don't know which runway they're on and so on. And so by you getting really clear about how you're going to land, you will land on time and effectively and achieve your strategic outcomes. It's so valuable to put effort into knowing your ending before you begin. All right, this is an incredibly important feature. So some strategies that you might want to use in constructing a good L15. One is you could use a really powerful story. This is gorgeous. This is a gorgeous way to have an L15. You have a story that ends exactly the way you want to end the entire presentation. One of the reasons I like using this strategy is that you know how long it takes to tell the story. You've told it. So you told it, it turns out it takes three and a half minutes. So that means that when you get the five minute warning that you're at the end of your talk, you know you have to start your story within a minute and a half. And you're, you, you, now you know you're gonna end on time. There's no doubt in your mind. Your sense of confidence never fades. It absolutely feels good to know that you're ending that way. The other thing is you could have a memorable quote. You could have like a quote that you wanna end on. You could put the quote up on the screen and then you've got this quote and it kind of just like wraps your whole presentation up and locks it down. You could do that. You could also have a clear call to action. This is really important if your talk is desired to inspire some sort of immediate action. Mm. For example, if you want them to go and buy your book, then you need to have a clear call to action. The books are at the back of the room. Go over there. I'll be at the table. You really tell them where it is and when to go and give them a clear call to action. And that can end your talk really profoundly. Yes, this is what to do next. Equally, if you're running, from off, uh, running, running for office, for example, if you're, if you're um, running for office, then you want to do the same thing there is that you want to get clear about what's the next action you want them to take. Uh, maybe you're doing a talk that's simply inspired, inspiring people to vote not even necessarily for you. You just want them to exercise the right of citizens to vote. So then you would say, now listen, your next call of action is to go and make sure that you're registered with the electoral poll and get out and vote and give them that clear call to action. So that's another way. Another version is to do a summary of your talk. You could do, okay, you, so you've done your talk and now you can say, so as a reminder, these are the things that we discussed during the presentation. We discussed that you should have a story journal. It's very, we discussed that you should have your strategic objectives, that you should have a story journal, that you should do a great F15, and that you should then have an L15. So by recapping what you've done, you, you, can, you can end on the summary. And then also, you might develop like a solid closing sentence, even a catchphrase that you might want to use. Right now, I'm at my very good friend Topher Morrison's office in, um, in Tampa. And for years and years, he would sign off a talk or a presentation or a video he's doing, and he would just say, at the end of his talk, he would say, take care, dare to dream, and make each day an epic adventure. And it became kind of a catchphrase so that people knew when he said that it was over, it marked it. And remember, it's not that you, can, that you only need to use one or two or three of these things. You can use them in, con, in combination. And, um, and so uh, these strategies, if you, if you really give thought to your L15 and construct them, you, 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 in the middle of your presentation, you'll just have a sense of calm because you know how you're landing the plane. I like this metaphor a lot because imagine what it must be like to be up in a plane and not be sure where the runway is, not be sure what the wind direction is, right? No, what we're saying is by getting your L15 locked in, you know exactly where the runway is, you know which way the wind is uh, blowing in from, and you know when to go and to begin your approach. And then you're going to end with a sense of confidence. You're going to end with a sense of solidity. Um, so yeah. So when you've so so again, <laughs> funny enough to recap, we've talked about your strategic objectives. We've talked about your your um, your story journal, your F15, and your L15. So now the key thing for us to do is to take a look at how do we put all this stuff together, all this stuff together in your signature presentation. Okay. So. There's a couple of things that I want to be clear about. Um, I'm curious how many of you, how many of you are um, in the habit of writing out your presentations before you go out to do, deliver them. So you're getting ready to do a speech and the night before you've written the speech out. Does anybody do that? Okay. 
So it looks like sometimes yes, no, yes, no. And I, I recognize a lot of the names that are of people that are saying no <laughs> as students of mine. And I know that there was a yes before it was a no for a lot of them. All right. So here's some advice I have for you. And you might want to write this down. You probably don't need to. It's only two words. Um, but if you've been writing out your talks, I've got some very important advice for you. Stop it. Okay. Stop it right now. Don't write your talks out anymore. I'm going to show you how to do this with your signature talk in a way that is so much better than writing out your talks. But I want to share with you why not to do that. I want to share with you why not to write it out. The reason you don't, there's a few reasons. One of them is the two primary ones. The one is that it'll change your tone of voice. Something happens when we write out text and I can tell when I see a speaker on stage that's written out their presentation because all of a sudden they start speaking in complete sentences. They talk the way they wrote it because they've been memorizing it that way. And so they talk in constructed sentences complete with proper punctuation. And you can hear it. You can hear it in their voice. It, 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 it's trans inducing and it's not authentic and it's difficult. It's difficult for the audience. The second reason not to write out your talks is that when you write out your talks, you engage a part of the brain that is not useful for professional speakers. And that is linear memory. You engage a part of your brain wherein you, you start memorizing the words of your presentation and the order of those words and the order of those sentences. And what that means is, is that you are trying to use an unbelievable amount of memory because if you're going to be speaking for 20 minutes, that's a lot of words to remember. And they have to order them. You have to remember them in the right order. And here's where it gets really tricky is you begin to recognize that it's not that you're just memorizing them but you're also anchoring the memories. What I mean is, is that this sentence leads to this sentence and leads to that sentence, which means that if you forget one of the sentences, well, there's a technical term for it, but if you forget one of the sentences, it means you're screwed. That's the technical term. You're, you're, what are you gonna do? You forgot the sentence, and that means it was the anchor to the next sentence. And so you've got a problem. And so that's a real challenge. And so what we wanna do is we want to move away from writing out the speeches and we use something that we have been teaching for many years called a speech map, a speech map. Now, some of you will have been familiar with uh, um, uh, mind mapping and mind mapping is a great system for, you know, setting goals and planning things in life and what have you. And all we've done is created a bit of a formula for using mind mapping as a way of planning your speeches. So you've got a template in your workbook there. Have a look at that. And what you'll see is there's a space for you to have your F15 and then there's space at the end for your L15. Those are the big circles because that's where you got to put them. I'm telling you, if you design a phenomenal F15 and a really great L15 and you got nothing in the middle, you'll make it work. I know that sounds a little scary and I'm not encouraging that you do that. But if you have a really strong start and you know your ending, it's really easy to fill in the blanks in the middle. That said, the way your speech map is gonna work is you're, you're going to take a look at your overall strategic objectives and, and then you're going to select stories from your story journal that help you to achieve the strategic objectives. Okay, so let's take a look at the hindsight window. In the hindsight window, I had a number of strategic objectives. Uh, the one was to introduce or debut the hindsight window for the public for the very first time. It's something I'd been thinking about and writing about for a long time, but I'd never, I'd never taught it to anybody. And the other one was, is to, for me, it was my own internal strategic objective, and that was to prove to myself that I was capable of designing truly compelling 20-minute talks, something I had had a bit of a block about before that. I'd always felt, look, you give me an hour and I can win over any audience, but 20 minutes, wow, it's tough. So that was one of my strategic objectives was to learn and grow from that. Uh, another strategic objective, as I told you before, was to get rebooked. Another one was to get published on the Mind Valley platform. Another one was to get media coverage and invites. I had a number of strategic objectives. And, and, and so the, the, the strategic objective that, that sort of informed the structure of the talk the most was that I wanted people to understand the hindsight window and, and be able to use it. This was not a 20 minute talk that I was doing where I'm going to do the 20 minute talk and then they have to come to a retreat and I can teach them a hindsight window. No, I wanted them in 20 minutes to understand the hindsight window so that they could really do it. And by the way, by way of measure, that talk was something like two years ago. I still get messages from people on Facebook telling me 
that they are using the principles in their life right now. That they, they like I, I had recently had this woman write to me and she goes, it's the weirdest thing. I watched your video on YouTube this morning in my office and came downstairs from my office and my car had been broken into. And my first reaction was anger and rage. And then suddenly I smiled and remembered the hindsight window. And I went through the steps and realized everything was gonna be okay. And if I had not watched your video that morning, my car being broken into that day and my things being stolen would have ruined the next two weeks of my life. Instead, it didn't even ruin 20 minutes. Wow. That's the power of a really great presentation. That's what I wanted to deliver. I knew that I wanted to create that result. That meant that I was going to have to pick stories that really taught the principles. Does that make sense to you guys? All right. So what are some of the stories I chose? Well, I know that what I wanted to show people was that the hindsight window works whether you're talking about the past, the present, or the future. In other words, that you could use the hindsight window to clean up your past. You could use the principles of the hindsight window to inoculate yourself against the future events. But most importantly, you could use the hindsight window to handle things as they're happening right now in the present. Because frankly, that's where life happens. Life didn't happen. Life doesn't happen in your past. Life doesn't happen in your future. Life happens in the right now. In fact, even right now, when you let the past get in the way, what you're doing is damaging the present with your past. And when you let the future get in the way, you're damaging your present with the future. Is it true? So the biggest one was the future. So I started thinking about, went through my story journal. I started thinking about times in my life when I'd used the hindsight window to clean up the past. And so I had a really great story about how I'd use the hindsight window to clean up the past. And it was a story of an event that I went through as a child at Christmas of 1977 or 78. And it was an event that I went through and I, I put Christmas 77, I put that story in, that story becomes the hindsight window relative to the past. Then I wanted to show people how I used the hindsight window to inoculate myself against events coming in the future. I had a problem with road rage and I knew in advance that I had a problem with road rage. So what did I do? I used the principle of the hindsight window and I told a story about road rage that I've been talking about. And then I wanted to find a way that I could really show that the hindsight window was incredibly powerful for the present. And immediately it came to me, the Plyero story. The Plyero story came to me that that will demonstrate to people how this works in the present. So you see what's going on is that I'm saying I want it, the, my point is it can work in the, in the it, it can work for the past, it can work for the, uh, for the future and it can work for the present. Those are the core points that I wanna make and as a result of that, I'm then going to choose stories accordingly. And so when I choose those stories, as you've seen, my, 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 you know, what I have to do is my, my, I've gotta describe what the hindsight window is, I have to de define it. You guys have watched the video, I don't need to define it again now. So I define it, then the point that I wanna make is you can use the principles to inoculate yourself from the past. So that's the point I wanna make. And, and so having made that point, um, I then can start looking through my journal and saying, hey, well, what stories might make that point really well? Okay, the next point that I want to make is, oh, the hindsight window can be used to inoculate you against things that happen in the future. Okay, then I can go in my story journal and go, oh, here's some examples. Okay, good, I've got a story. And then I want to go, hey, the hindsight window works even better when you use it in the present so you don't have to clean up your past, right? And so then I thought, what's the best story for that? Story journal, boom, plyro story. So it starts with knowing what points that I want to make and then being able to flow through and pick the stories that I have that will tell those stories best. When I'm done with that, I want you to think about what I have. I have a single sheet of paper. And on that single sheet of paper, I have a map that achieves the strategic outcomes that I already designed. It has an F-15, so I know I'm gonna launch really well. The F-15 might have a little icebreaker story, it might have a big fat claim, and so on. It then, has the different stories that I wanna make and the different points that they make. And then it's got the L15, so I know I'm gonna land really well, which means that I'm in a position to simply drop in and deliver that talk. It is that simple, it's that powerful. When you put all these principles together, you can put a talk together in 10 minutes and walk on stage and deliver it, which means you can be that speaker that if you happen to be an event, like I'm going to an event in Austin, Texas in a couple of days, they want to book me for next year. By the time I met the organizers, it was too late uh, to book me for this year. 
but they said, but listen, if you're going to be there, would you be prepared to be a backup speaker? Because we often have like gaps that we want to fill. Uh, yeah, no problem. Don't you want to be able to do that? No problem. I can walk up and just do it. And so the, you can use this system for creating a full on powerful signature presentation. You can also use this system for being able to create a presentation in a heartbeat when you need to. So remember that step one is to develop your strategic outcomes. This step two is to have already been working on organizing your stories in a story journal. Every time you're having a life experience that's creating an emotion for you, then you are in a story. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I'm in a Newark airport and, and no kidding, the guy won't take my bag on the connecting flight. My wife, it's her birthday, it's New Year's Eve, we're headed to San Diego and he won't take my bag. And it was awful, she was already on the plane. The captain was holding the plane for us, but this obstructive little guy would not take my bag on the plane just because he was being difficult. And I was, ah, I just got angry and I was frustrated and I was getting help from these people. And in the middle of it all, I suddenly realized, oh my God, I'm in a story. And I am in a story, and I now use that story in some of our workshops to teach state management again. And so remember to organize your stories. Remember that you need a powerful F-15 launch effectively. You need your L-15 so that you know with confidence how you're going to land and achieve your ultimate strategic objectives in that L-15. And then, of course, if you put all these things together in a speech map, you're in an incredibly powerful position because with that speech map, you don't need to memorize anything. Remember, by the way, I'll tell you, I've cheated occasionally. I've taken my um, uh, speech map and taped it on the floor on the stage in front of me. So if ever I just need to glance down and see where I'm at, it's right there. It's so simple and so easy. In fact, the very first event I ever did with Tony Robbins, I was in Fiji and I, was, and I hadn't been on stage. Guys, get this. I hadn't been on stage for three years. I'd been running a movie studio in Northern California. I hadn't been on stage for three. I'm, okay, when I say I hadn't been on stage, let me be very accurate. I'd spoken at the odd film festival, but not inspiration, motivation type stuff, more like 3D, you know, 3D film and, you know, like the business stuff. And I'd done maybe three or four of those. So in three years, I really hadn't properly been on stage. So I did, and I'm now going to be on stage for three hours. And so I grab my speech maps. I draw them out on big, like, you know, flip chart paper. And I walk up to Tony's people and I'm a bit embarrassed about it. And I say, would you guys mind taping these down on the stage for me? And they looked at me like it was a totally normal request. I expected them to kind of go, what, who is this loser who needs his notes on the stage, right? And, and, and then they looked at me like it was a totally normal thing. And so we walk up, go up the stairs onto the stage. This is my first time on Tony Robbins stage, imagine. And then I look down and like my maps are already there, only they're not there. They're in the hands of the person. Who, and I look, it's not my maps, it's Tony's maps. He uses the exact same maps. I mean, it was the same marker, same color. And you know, like, I, if, I hadn't, if I hadn't looked at them in detail, I would have just glanced down and seen my own maps down there. And so, yes, absolutely, you can take your maps and you can move them down onto the stage. And you know what's crazy? You won't even look at them. They're like a security blanket. You, you, once you've created these maps, a picture's worth a thousand words, and you're now memorizing the pictures, not a thousand words. You're, remember, you're, you're remembering five things. Instead of having to remember 5,000 words, you're remembering five things, and you will now be able to walk on stage in any, any situation. So here's my question for you. Can you see the possibility of this? Can you see the application of this? I'd love to hear from you. Where could you, if, with this skill, where could you be able to use something like this? Bear in mind, you are, I really know this about you. How many of you feel like you are one truly great talk away from greatness? One truly great talk away from achieving what it is that you want to achieve in your business, in your speaking life, or what have you. Uh, you know, one of the things that I, um, uh, we were talking about Simon Sinek earlier. In October of 2011, you can see on the slide, Simon Sinek's speaking fees were $25,000. April 2019, $100,000 to do one presentation. How many of you feel like you might be one talk away from real greatness? And, and, and yeah, let me, I'd love to know, I see some of you having some great areas where you might be able to use these things. And I'd love to, uh, um, I, you know, I want you to tap in for a minute. You know, you see um, Renee Brown, she's so special today. She really is. She's a phenomenal woman. She's a great storyteller. But before all that, she was just like you and me. She's just doing her thing. 
and now you know she's on Oprah. She's her speaking fees are phenomenal. Uh, you'd be amazed at the power of what we call the stage effect when you can stand up in front of an audience and you can authentically deliver compelling in information, it can completely transform the world for you. So right now, I would say to you that you're one great talk away from a lot of the things that you want in your life. You're one talk away from financial freedom, any of you. You're one talk away from a best-selling book. You're one talk away from the media that you, that you want to create. Uh, you're one talk away from the, you know, wanting the, the, the number of followers that you have on, on social media. You're, you're, what can it do for you to put that one really great talk up? Because I'll tell you what it did for me. When I put that hindsight window talk up, I was already doing some speaking here or there. And it's not like that hindsight window went massively viral. I think it's maybe had 80 or 90,000 views. I've got other videos that have a lot more. But the difference with that talk is the people who watch that talk, they watch the whole thing. They go right into it. It's deep. And, and it's created so many opportunities for me, so many interviews, so many speaking bookings. And it did what I wanted it to do. It got me rebooked to speak at Mind Valley events again and again and again. I've spoken at a ton of AFEST events. I've spoken at every Mind Valley reunion. I'm now often speaking at the Mind Valley summits in Europe for Mind Valley Russia. That one really well delivered talk landed me many direct bookings with the same person and even more indirect bookings. It also uh, managed to achieve the second objective. And that second objective was to get published on the Mind Valley platform. Today, WildFit has reached thousands and thousands of people in over 20 countries around the world and is the highest rated program on the Mind Valley platform because of one talk. So I really want to be clear about what you are one talk away from. Really get clear about that. What are you? And I really want to know, what are you one talk away from? If you, if you had that powerful signature talk created and you delivered it well on the right stage or in front of the right camera or on YouTube and it really did what it was supposed to do, what are you one presentation away from? Now, in the meantime, you might be asking yourself another question. And the other question is, okay, but like, do I have what it takes? You know, do I have to be like some, you know, massive extrovert to do this? No! I am not the least bit extroverted. I'm, I'm maybe one of the least extroverted people like you could have a chance to meet. I'm not. I, I you know, um, He walks up to stranger and he says hello and he knows everybody and he's he's a pretty bloody extroverted introvert and that's because he learned the skill set right he, he he pushes himself through it I'm the last person I go to a networking event I'm I'm not it's not that I'm shy I'm just not extroverted being a great um, speaker does not require being extroverted that way at all it also hang on here to uh, Okay, it, it, there's, there's a couple of other things is that you, you might feel like, um, uh, you might feel like uh, that, you know, you compare yourself. You might look at a Brennan Brown talk or you might look at a Simon Sinek talk and, you, and uh, Simon, Simon Sinek or my talk or something like that. And you go, yeah, but these people, you know, look at them. You know who they were right before their one talk? They were those people over there that you'd never heard of. But you see, invoking the power of the stage effect and putting together a really talk made it open for them and so what you what you really need to do is be clear about what it is that you want to achieve you want to, you have to have a sense of passion and perseverance for what to create you know uh, you, you 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 need to be able to overcome things as they come up either before the bookings or after the bookings when somebody says to you hey your talk's going to be um 30 minutes and all of a sudden they go well we only have 15 minutes for you you need to be okay to go, no problem, and, and have a positive outlook about that. The, the easier you are to work with, the more often you get booked. You also need to have the courage, the courage to step outside your comfort zones, the courage to, to operate from a position of taking some chances here and there. Um, walking up in front of an audience takes courage. Standing in front, you know, I had to go and do, um, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was also here in Florida and I was down in Orlando. Why? Well, because I was recording a bunch of health segments for the Golf Channel. I have to tell you something, guys. I mean, I wasn't nervous about it or anything, but it's a different level of courage to go and record in an NBC studio for something that they're going to be playing over and over and over again. You got you to gotta have a sense of that courage. And um, 
Also, here's something else I want you to, and I want to know how many of you guys really have this. A sense of what it would be like for your audience if they don't get your message. Because that's kind of what happens to me sometimes is I'm standing there and one of the reasons that I am able to deliver the way I deliver, flying all around the world, forgetting about jet lag and just stepping on stage in the heart every single time is that before I walk on stage, I imagine the, um, I imagine the audience if I do my job really well and then I imagine them if I don't and I'm not prepared to let them down. And if you've got that inside you, even a little bit of it, you've got what it takes to make this work. So what's key to me is that all of those things, the perseverance, the passion, the connection with the audience, it's all those things are great, but I absolutely could never have achieved what I've achieved in the speaking space without the right peers, without the right mentors, without the right people around me to stimulate me. In fact, I'm sitting in here in Topher Morrison's office. Some of you I saw in the comments know Topher. Uh, Topher was one of my original influences. The very first speaking tour I ever did was with Topher. He was doing a speaking tour around the UK and I was the opening speaker for him. Um, having somebody like Topher at that stage of my career was an incredibly valuable thing. Having somebody who could guide me, answer my questions, allowed me to avoid some of the mistakes I might otherwise have made was incredibly valuable. Having uh, my good friend Carl Pearsall, the organizer and the original founder of the Yes Group in London, uh, they gave me my first platforms. They, they gave me my first opportunities to speak. Having somebody like the Toastmasters environment around me, those led to being, being able to attract an even like a uh, wider group of mentors. Uh, Jack Canfield, you can see in the photograph here, is a very, very good friend of mine. I like this particular picture because the author of the book that I'm holding up, I got that picture for her as a favor because she's one of my speaking students and she now sends many of her uh, employees to come to our programs on a regular basis. So I went and had this photograph of her book taken with Jack and had Jack sign and so on. Um, of course, Tony Robbins has been a huge influence on me. But I want you to know, you don't have to know Tony for him to be a good influence on you. If you're interested in his style of speaking, wow, there's tons of YouTube videos, there's his seminars and so on. And then I was lucky enough to get the opportunity to go on tour with him for a year and a half and have him personally coach me on how to really create deeper engagements with the audience, how to keep energy high on the stage and so on. And so it's been really valuable for me to have like a mix of mentors. Uh, Ivan Meisner, some of you will know in the, in the picture here is um, one of my dearest friends and the founder of BNI. Um, and just, you know, having great mentors around you is incredibly, incredibly valuable. Now, in one sense, I don't like showing those particular pictures because you're like, yeah, well, we don't have those mentors. No, neither did I. I worked my way up to those mentors, but I also recognized something. I was learning from all three of them before I ever got to meet them. Jack Canfield was an influence on me for over a decade before I ever met him, before he and I became friends. Tony Robbins was an influence on me since I was 17, 18 years old. So, you know, remember that your mentors don't always have to be there with you face to face. They're people that you get a chance to learn from. And, and one, of the, it's one of the biggest gifts that I love to give back to the world right now is helping people find their voice, helping them do exactly this. Like you have stories inside you, you have compelling life experience that's really valuable to other people. And maybe you don't have that network of people around you to really help make all that stuff happen. And that's ultimately why I created our speaker and author's mastermind group is to help people figure that out, to be around like-minded people that we're going to be able to, you know, um, support each other in moving themselves forward, but at the same time also get really, really solid educational content. So the, 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 the speaking kind of mastermind is a, um, it's a, a membership where every single month we have uh, calls that we do together and with either with me or with specialists and what have you that talk about all the va all the, the, the key aspects of becoming a really compelling speaker, whether you want to do that from the perspective of being a professional speaker or whether it's just that you want to speak to support your business. Um, it, it, it's about becoming effective as a, a storyteller and effective as a speaker about how to get booked, uh, where to get your practice in, how to, how to cultivate your stories, and also how to tell stories really effectively and so on. So 
if you are the least bit interested in building a brand or a business around speaking or adding speaking on, you know, like if you're a business owner and you want to use speaking to increase your influence and increase your brand, uh, then that's also a really great uh, platform. If you want to learn the, ba the basics of building a really solid presence on social media so that you create engaging content that people want to follow, um, then, the, you know, then absolutely the SAM program is a good hit for you. And, and also understanding that if you really understand the value of building a community, like if you really get that, uh, here's one of my great examples of this is that I remember in the early days of watching Deepak Chopra and Wayne Dyer, I really like watched something magical happen there that a lot of people didn't really notice, but the two of them always told stories about each other. The, 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 the two of them always told stories about each other. In other words, they were constantly building each other up. This is something Topher and I have done each, for the, each other for years. It's something Carl and I have done for each other for years. It's something that my friend Roland Tokyo and Estonia and I have done each other for years is that we are always building each other up. Listen, if you say a lot of great stuff about you, how much credibility does that have? But if somebody else says a lot of great stuff about you, wow, it has power. And so by having a really powerful community around you that can support you, is re that's really powerful. And, and clearly if you're at a level where you're kind of, willing to move past the wouldn't it be nice if I could be good at this and you're actually like ready to get your story out in the world. I, I'd love, I'd love, love, love to see you um, uh, become a member of our SAM program because we can really take you to another, another level in not, not just one time, but over the space of months and years to really help you transform your abilities as a speaker and your, um, uh, and, and your reach in the market especially if you're interested in, uh, in getting out more internationally because our members are from all over the world. So what this means is that every single month you'll have access to live virtual training workshops. So we have like this, we have these like deep detailed training workshops every single month on various aspects. Sometimes it's about speaking itself. Sometimes it's about the business of speaking. Sometimes it has to do with other things like writing books and so forth. It's everything that's needed to have a really great platform as a speaker. So there's all kinds of different uh, um, topics that are largely driven by what the members are looking for. And if I'm not the expert on that topic, then we bring it into somebody else. If, 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 or, so it's either me or a, a top level um, a presenter helping with that stuff. You can see here's an example of some of the different topics we have, how to get free PR and podcast interviews, how to make sure your LinkedIn profile is set up really well as a speaker and so on. So there's some really, really good curriculum every single month to incrementally help you establish and improve your brand every step of the way. It's an, an incredibly, uh, um, it's an incredibly powerful format and a great structure for you. In essence, you know, our thought process here or our mission of what we want to achieve for you is to create, um, you know, to, 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 to give you the skills and the network and the resources that you need to, um, to really achieve what you want to, um, with your platform, with your, with your speaking. And when you get, you know, speaking can often feel a little bit lonely. Like, you know, it does mean travel a lot of times. Don't worry, as you get better at it, the travel's at the front of the plane. That's the very good news. I mean, I'll tell you something. I love flying in business class, but my favorite thing about flying business class is when somebody else was paying for the business class ticket. That's my favorite thing. So, uh, so the, 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 this, this entire program is about helping you to create what you need to create as a speaker. The good thing about it is, is that, you know, yes, of course, we have live training programs that you can come to and they're, they're live with me directly all and they're, they're obviously, um, you know, there's some cost considerations of those. What we've done with Sam has made it incredibly convenient. There's no travel. It's all done with Zoom. Every call is recorded. So if you miss one, you still get it. And we've made it incredibly affordable for people. There's a great sense of community and accountability, which means that not only do you have me and our staff that's sort of supporting you and helping you through it, you've got each other. We've created this mastermind so that you can support each other, help each other get speaking gigs, uh, when you learn a new hack about how to work and do, do, do this or do that, it's something that the team shares with each other. And then, of course, super professional training from me and other total industry leaders that can really help you to achieve what you want. SAM is an incredibly powerful process, uh, empower, uh, incredibly powerful program to help you to get where it is that you want to go. And the key thing also is if you've, get, if you've gotten to know me at all, one of the things you'll know about me is I am all about fun. And that's a big aspect of what happens in, in Sam is that we make the, we really try to work fun into everything that we're doing because the truth is the minute something isn't fun anymore, you may as well stop. And I'm not saying it has to be fun every moment. There are, there are days where I'm on planes flying somewhere and going, okay, this flight's a little longer than I want. I wish we hadn't sat on the runway for two hours, but overall, 
the fun and enjoyment and fulfillment that I get from um, really sharing this stuff all around the world and running these masterminds and helping people find their voice just completely juices me. So my question for you is, are you, are you ready at this stage to like invest in yourself and your future as a speaker? Are you, are you in the interest? Are you like, I'm mildly curious or I am ready to move forward because if you're ready to move forward, then I want to encourage you to join our SAM program and let's get started on your speaking career. Let's get started with taking what you, you now have a, a skill set from this masterclass. You now know the formula for building a signature talk. Let's take that signature talk and let's turn it into a really powerful, compelling career, taking wherever you are now and taking you even further. The SAM program is incredibly affordable. It's only $247 per month. It, it gives you immediately, immediate access to the entire program and all the calls that have taken place since we started SAM have been recorded. So you get access to everything that's happened in the past as well. So it's not just what's coming. You also get the things that we've taught in the past as a sort of, in a sense, as a bonus. And the other thing that we have here is we have a, um, a price lock guarantee. And the way the price lock guarantee works is this, is that as SAM increases in price, as, obviously as the back catalog of content gets deeper and deeper, it becomes a more valuable proposition. As the network grows and has more people in it, it has a higher value proposition. But we have a price lock guarantee, and that is that whenever you join SAM, that's your price for as long as you're a member of the mastermind. And so it's 247 per month right now. Obviously that will not be the case uh, in the future, but you are locked in at 247. Your price will never go up. Uh, we just, you know, again, this isn't primarily, obviously this is a business, but primarily it's around building a really solid community of people that are committed to getting their stories out into the world. We also have some sort of, I guess, uh, a bonuses, like some things that we know that you need that we want to make sure you get. So you get a social media, um, uh, uh, quick tips list. In other words, a guide to some of the key things as a speaker that you want to create in social media. Um, in other words, uh, while we do have specific master classes on Facebook and on LinkedIn and so on, there's a, a, a little bit of a, a, you know, a cheat sheet, if you will, on some of the key principles that you want to pay attention to in social media. We also have a uh, document folder full of done for you templates, speaker agreements, contracts, all that stuff, so that you don't have to go and figure that stuff out. We also have a, a, a sample of an introduction script because every speaker should have their own introduction script. So we have a formula for helping you create your own introduction script, uh, introduction script so that this, this is a script that somebody reads before you go on stage. And it's really important that it's well constructed and well written and that they deliver it correctly. Um, we also have the presentation checklist. And what this is, is basically it's like your shopping list for what you need to make sure is ready for your, uh, for your presentation. And, and the beautiful thing about this I, I recommend is that you, you, you know, take a look at it and modify it as you will, but then you send it out to the producers before you ever get to the event. So all of your things are already taken care of. So you'll find that when I go to an event, there's always six bottles, glass bottles of water on the, on the stage with me, the particular markers that I like that, that, and so on. And um, you'll also get uh, sample emails for price uh, negotiation and communication with promoters and that kind of stuff to kind of help you to figure out how to have those conversations. And also you get, as a member of SAM, you get 50% off uh, a ticket to our speaking academy five-day intensive program when you're ready to do that one day in the future as well as a member of sam you get 50 percent off that is a massive massive savings off the normal cost of that program so that's a big benefit and again i'll tell you why that is um, the reason we do that is that the business freedom speaking academy is a highly intensive super powerful really effective personal transformation process that brings out the authentic and really shows you how to tell stories in a valuable and, and powerful way. It's, it may, I mean, uh, it is by far and away our highest rated live event and our live events are all among the highest rated in the industry, but it is by far and away our highest rated event. It's in, it, it, it's super fun, really powerful, super transformative. And the reason that we give Sam members such a deep discount on the program is that we like working with people. In other words, it's one thing to have you come and spend the five days. It's another thing that you've spent the five days and now we get to work with you month on month on month on month, helping you build upon the things you learned there. Or in the other version, if you've spent a year in the SAM program before you're ready to do the Speaking Academy, you've got so much of the foundation so that when you go to the Speaking Academy, it just allows you to launch to a whole nother level. And so that's why we give that discount to our, uh, 
to our SAM members. If, for those of you who are curious about the Speaking Academy, we have two left this year. Um, Oslo, there are four places left, June 11th to the 15th in Oslo. The venue there is really beautiful. It's a, we take over the whole resort for ourselves. It's a beautiful resort. It's actually outside Oslo by about 40 minutes or so. And it's up in the mountains. It's like in, in the hills, there's farm country around and beautiful views of lakes and such. And we take over the whole resort. So it's really like summer camp. Super, super fun place to be. There's only four places left for that one. And then we're doing it in Pula, Croatia, and June 23rd to 27th. And that's part of Mind Valley University. And there are only 17 spots left for that. And Mind Valley has just started their marketing campaign for that. The event was almost sold out before any of us started marketing it from last year. Um, and they're just about to start their marketing campaign for that. So if you're curious about either of those programs, definitely get in touch and book a discovery call with Ryan and our team who can uh, help you to figure out if this is the right year for you to do that. So uh, that's the, the, and remember, as a member of SAM, you get a 50% discount off that program. So definitely that is a good step for you to take. Now, you might be asking yourself a really important question, one that I asked myself before I went to, I, you know, <laughs> listen, I was not a natural born speaker, <laughs> like not at all. I was terrified of it. I was clumsy with storytelling. I spoke at a million miles an hour. I know I still talk a little quickly, but it's better. <laughs> and, uh, um, but I was, uh, I was by no means a natural born speaker and I attended over $100,000 worth of courses on speaking. I read every book I could find and I watched videos all the time on how to dissect them and so on. And so if you're asking yourself this question of like, um, you know, can a speaker training really be effective? Can it really teach me things? I, I want you to know that I am really good at what I do in this space. Uh, any of you who have done WildFit already know this. You already know that I'm incredibly good at, at, at creating lasting transformation for people. And it's no less special in the way we do it with speaking. And so, you know, wherever you are on the fear spectrum, if you are anywhere, if you are anywhere on the fear spectrum, like anything from mildly nervous to abject terrified, um, I can absolutely help you to transform that. And if fear isn't an issue for you at all, it's really just about skills transfer. Like you're just trying to figure out how do I really tell my stories effectively in an engaging way? You know, you, we are absolutely going to get you there through Sam, through the Speaking Academy, or through some combination of both over time if you do both. There, there's no question that speaking training can work. Uh, and particularly, again, I, I happen to be... Um, you know what, I've got a real passion for transformation. And so really helping people get to the other side um, and get to the place where they're being authentic and they're really delivering well is important to me. When we first started speaker training, we only did it because our clients demanded it. And my wife, Elise, who's kind of like our quality assurance offer officer, was a little bit reluctant. Um, she said, look, what you do in business is world-class. What you do with WildFit is world-class. I've never seen you teach anybody speaking except for a few friends for advice or what have you. And she goes, are you really sure you want to do this? Like, you know, if you do this and it doesn't go really well, it's going to tarnish the brand. And I said, listen, I am absolutely certain we've got about 25 people coming to this first workshop. And, um, and here's what I told her. I said, five of them will have life altering transformations and become phenomenal speakers. Another 15 of them will be transformed really well and become really good speakers. And you know, the, the balance of Um, the average seminar creates results for something like 3% of the audience, right? So if I could achieve that, she'd be pretty impressed. And instead what happened was we launched the program and we had something like 20 of the 25 people tell us afterward that it was one of the most deeply transformative programs they'd ever done in their life um, and completely transformed their abilities as speakers. And the five, the other five said basically the same thing. So like it, it, it completely, in fact, one, um, uh, the guy showed, he was an accountant with not a great deal of external um, personality per se, and went on to win a number of comedy championships at Toastmasters after doing the program. So yes, absolutely, training works. It absolutely does. Um, I think they've shown you the slides here, some testimonies from people around the world that have worked with us either in the SAM program or, or in the Speaking Academy and so forth. Uh, Rusty, by the way, Rusty, you're here. I saw you in the chat earlier. Here's what Rusty said. I saw her commenting in the chat. Absolutely. Matter of fact, Rusty, go ahead and write in the comments if you want to add to this. It'd be cute. But anyway, um, she says, absolutely worth every penny. Eric's team is amazing. I happily give my time to volunteer in the group just to witness from the outside the transformations that take place. I do mark my life by before working with Eric and everything that is happening now. 
Uh, thank you very much. You know, and, and so yes, training absolutely does work. So when you've got a trainer that you feel like you connect, connect with, and hey, look, that might be me and it might be a number of other people. I'm just saying definitely investing in yourself as a speaker works. I attended over $100,000 worth of speaker training. Oh, by the way, what does that mean for you? It means you, you get to learn a whole lot of stuff from me that I went out and paid good money to learn. So, and, and by the way, most of you know, I'm a little bit crazy about the way I offer guarantees on stuff because frankly, I don't want to take your money if I can't get the result. And so the guarantee that we offer for the same, pro for the SAM program is that if after your first year in the SAM program, you have not made at least twice as much money as you have invested, we will give your money back. Like where else are you getting hundred percent? a hundred percent return guarantee. We're saying if you don't get at least a hundred percent return on your investment, we will just give your money back. And, and look, I know not all of you, it's about the money. And so I'll let you measure it however you want. If it's, if you're a politician, for example, and you don't feel like it absolutely was um, valuable to you in terms of translating into votes, in terms of translating into following or donations, which is a form of money, then, you know, that's fine. What I'm saying to you is if you don't feel like you got at least a hundred percent return on your investment, after a year of, of participation in the program, we'll simply give your money back. Because as I said, we are really more interested in results than we are in having your money. The, the key thing here is making sure that you get the results that you need to get. So I want to implore you to one way or the other, if you are on this call right now, it's because you're curious about communication whether you want to speak in front of an audience or in front of a camera or in front of the media or all, a media or all of those things. It's because you want to get out there and make some kind of difference for you, your family, your business or whatever, or all of those things. And the question really comes up is like, are you in a position or are you ready to start investing the, your time, your effort, your energy, your money, and really becoming phenomenally good at this? It's absolutely one of the single best investments I imagine you can make. I'll remind you, it is in the, the SAM program is really low entry point. It's as easy as it can be for you to get into. It's 247 per month. Again, it gives you all of the stuff that you, all of the, the sessions that we've recorded since we launched SAM before become yours immediately in the library. Um, and of course the live calls every month, you get it. You, you, you get access to the Facebook group with all the other SAM members. You get the speaker's toolkit as a bonus. Plus you get 50% off the speaking academy training when you're ready to go. And as we said, when you register now, you lock that price in for life. So when the price goes up, like when we launched Sam, it was actually less money. So the members that were in at the beginning pay a little less than this. When we raise the price next year, you'll be locked in at this price. And so, uh, we, and, and our, our goal is to work with you to get you to where you wanna be with your speaking career. So my question for you is how will you take action? Like, you know, is, is taking action for you at this point going, all right, that was a good webinar, I've, I've learned, I'm gonna go somewhere. Or is taking action being, you know what, May is the month that I begin. May is the month that I begin to take everything to the next level, whether you're starting your career right now or whether you're in your career and you wanna move it to another level. And I wanna share a funny story with you. About four or five years ago, I did a webinar a bit like this and I, I emailed it out to, um, to our database. And I said, hey guys, I'm doing a webinar on uh, speaking because so many of my clients have been asking about how I do what I do on stage and so on. And, and, and I sent the email out personally to the database. And so a lot of people wrote back and I had a bunch of people write to me, no kidding, and this is what they wrote. I'm already a professional speaker, so I don't need to be there. Thank you very much. Huh. I'll tell you my, I got. <laughs> hey, I think I'm back. I don't know what happened to our internet here. I think I'm back. But what I was saying is, is that our, um, you know, one of the key things is uh, 
um, is, is uh, my glass is never full. I am learning all the time. I'll tell you that when I sat down with Tony Robbins, I knew I was fairly good at what I was doing. And we sat down, Elise and I sat down with Tony and Sage and had lunch. And for like 30 minutes at the beginning of lunch, Tony Robbins did this. He goes, Eric, I loved your presentation. I love the way you started it like this. And then you went like this and you did this. And, and he went on for 30 minutes about the different stories that he liked and how he liked this and like that. And you know, it was really, it, it, it got so overwhelming to me. And eventually I said, Tony, I so appreciate hearing this from you, from you particularly, but I'll tell you what I really want to know. What I really want to know is how can I make it even better? And his eyes lit up and he then went into coaching on uh, this can be better and this can be better and so on. And so I want you to know that I have never, ever stopped learning, never, never stopped uh, um, pushing to become better and better and better. And so, uh, yes, I know that <laughs> I know it sounded a little Tony Robbins like my wife has a bit of a crush on Tony Robbins. So I've, I've learned that I can perfect the voice for her. <laughs> so in any event, um, go out and get yourself registered. And what I want you to think about is this. I really want you to think about this. What if you really are one talk away? One talk away from business class travel on somebody else's time, like one talk away from a book deal and one talk away from getting the TV special that you want to create. Like many of you are truly one talk away from everything it is that you want to create. And so this webinar has already given you an, a huge amount of value for how you can build that one talk. There's no question about it. You don't, you, you start there. And if you're really committed to taking that one talk far and developing more than just one talk, then just take a moment and think about that. What does it create for you? What does it create for your family? What does it create for your community? And what does it create for your larger audience that you want to reach? I think some of you have audiences that might be even global in nature. What does it take for you um, to be, you know, how does it feel to you to be able to get out there and really achieve that stuff? And so I want to do a little poll here. Assuming you had that really like awesome one talk that achieved that you knew was making it happen for you. How does that feel to you? What's the one word that describes how it feels to be confident about the structure of your talk and the delivery of it? Freedom, blessed, empowering, peace, empowerment, free and satisfied. These are some really, really good words. These are some really good words. Everything, yeah, that's really good. And let me ask you something else. Who is helped by you doing this? Who is helped by you having a really powerful way of getting your message out into the world. Who is helped by that? Everyone around you, teenagers, angry people, family, the planet, everyone who hears you, community and family, yourself, a, a lock, I hope I said that right. You're right, you, that's a great one. Everyone, yeah, that's exactly right. Thank you guys, that's, that's powerful stuff. I really believe that, um, you know, some people like, I, I'm just here for the audience and other people like, frankly, and I, how many of you have ever seen that speaker who's just there for themselves, right? You know what I think the balance is? You got to be there for yourself. You got to put your oxygen mask on. If you're not having fun, if it's not fulfilling, if it's not helping you live a fantastic lifestyle, that's a problem. But equally, if that's all it's doing, it's empty. It's got to be about the larger community and the larger planet and the larger um, impact that you're having. And so that's, that's super, that's super inspiring what you guys are, are answering. Um, and I believe that we are going to move to Q&A. Are you guys up for a little Q&A? I love to do Q&A because this is where I make sure that I actually answer your questions. And, uh, and that's really great. What I want to make sure you do, though, is I want to be clear. Go right now to businessfreedom.com slash Sam and get your application completed and get yourself um, applied in for Sam. Get it done. Let's start with May and let's start to transform your business, your life, your speaking career, and so on. And with that, businessfreedom.com slash Sam, then uh, let's jump into the Q&A. And I guess you guys on my team, you're gonna curate Q&A for me? Hello? Hey, Eric, it's Jackie, how are you? Hey, good. Good, okay, so we're gonna start with the questions, and we're gonna start with the first one from Amy. I have a lot of stories, how can I identify which are the right ones to be in my signature talk? Yeah. Okay. So did you say Lori? That was Amy. Oh, Amy, Amy. Hey, Amy. Okay. So uh, the clue, the, the first answer is 
when you've got a really good list of strategic outcomes, it's really going to help you to know which store to choose. So let's say, for example, you, you want to make the point that um, always be kind. Let's say you just have this point you want to make about always be kind. So then you look through your story journal and you see you've got like six stories in there that are tagged for kindness, right? So the question is, which of those stories do you want to use? And so what you're going to do to choose that story is you're going to think about who the audience is. You're going to think about your strategic objectives and you're going to think about other stories you might want to tell. And between those three things, you're going to find that one of the stories you've highlighted slots in really nicely. What's really amazing about this though, Amy, is that you have a, um, let's say you've got your signature talk put together and you've got this story about, you know, kindness, but it takes like 18 minutes to tell that story. But suddenly the producer comes along and says, we have to cut 10 minutes off your presentation. You're now in a position to go back to your story journal and look for other stories on kindness. And you look, oh, look, I've got a six minute story on kindness and you can swap the story in. So that, that's the beauty of the way this structure works is it's modular. It's like, um, uh, it's, it's, it's modular and it's systemic. So you're going to choose by knowing your strategic outcomes. Here's an example as well. Um, in strategic outcomes, uh, like for example, the example I already used, let's say I want to, one of my strategic outcomes is, uh, you know, to, I want to, sorry, I want to tell some stories about kindness. And, um, and then also one of my strategic outcomes happens to be to get media interviews. So then what happens is I go, you know, I, um, I was in Stockholm and I got this request from this woman who wanted to do a podcast interview with me and I really didn't have time to do it, but her email was really nice. And we looked at her branding and stuff and she just was doing such a great job in doing such work. We really wanted to support her. And, you know, and I'm, I'm really of the opinion of where, you know, when in doubt, you got to go with kindness, you got to do the best you can. And so the best that I could do was offer her 15 minutes. And I, and, and the team made it clear to her that I only had the 15 minutes. She was so sweet. She didn't try to push for more time. It was really, really excellent. But she was so touched by the fact that we made that 15 minutes for her that she then tracked me down in Italy a couple of weeks later to do the full one hour interview with me. So now here's the thing, Amy, imagine that I have another story about kindness that I could tell. But if my strategic objective is to get bookings with podcast interviews, then I'm going to choose that story because it achieves one of my strategic objectives. Uh, another version might be that I'm telling two different stories about, um, you know, about, uh, oh, that's a good example. I might be telling two, two different stories about how to use the hindsight window in the present, right? And the one story I could use is the Plyaro story where everything got stolen. And the other story could be the time that I was in a casino in the Bahamas when four men, this is no kidding, a true story, four men walked in with automatic assault rifles and started shooting up the casino. They're both great stories for how you use the hindsight window in the present. But if one of my strategic objectives is that I want to get an agent to write a book, then I'm going to use the one with the ply arrow. Why? Because in that story, I talk about how I've been writing this book about the hindsight window and my unbacked up copy is on the laptop that was just stolen. So now everybody in the audience knows there's a book I'm writing. So that's, you're going to, your strategic objective is going to help you to choose. That's a great question, Amy. Thank you so much. I hope that answer, answer helps. Okay. The next question is from Deborah and Deborah is wondering how much time will the SAM training take each month? Ah, how long will the SAM training take each month? Well, the calls are about two hours, 90 minutes to two hours. And then there's some assignments that we give you after, which you do on your own time. They might be to record a video or to do some research or what have you. Um, so probably your sort of minimum investment is about three hours per month. And then, of course, if you're really gung ho, you're going to have in any given month. The calls themselves are about two hours and uh, and they're recorded. So if you have to miss part of it or, or God forbid, all of one because you have got something else going on, you'll still have access to the recording. Great, and I'll just roll off that. Anonymous asked if they get access to the past video recordings, and the answer is yes. You'll get yes, access yes, you to do. all the past video recordings. So That's the next right. question is from William. How do you design your talk to be both entertaining and informative at the same time? William, that's such a great question. And I'm going to challenge you and I'm going to say this. If it's not entertaining, it's not informative. <laughs> I know that might sound a little weird, but, you know, I was at this uh, talk in uh, Bali a couple of years ago, maybe earlier last year. 
and there was a guy speaking about health in some way and and he stood up and he said i've got 27 strategies for improving your longevity or something and in the space of 30 minutes he went through the 27 strategies and he just it was so informative 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 infor i don't remember a single one of the 27 and neither does anyone else from the audience who didn't take notes if you weren't there taking pictures of every slide if you weren't there taking notes no memory got created because there was no entertainment the fact is is that um, is that emotions are the glue that cause information to stick. Emotions are the glue that cause memories to happen. And so if you aren't engaging, if you aren't entertaining, then it can be as informative as you like, but no information will be retained by the audience. And so I believe that you should use what we call in our speaking academy and, and we teach in SAM something called IPMs. They are impacts per minute. That is how many emotional impacts are you generating per minute that you're speaking? It doesn't mean every minute has to have an emotional impact, but it means you want to know what your average emotional impact is over the space of your 20 minute talk or your one hour talk. I'll give you a hint. If your IPM is at least one, then you are giving what could be considered to be a professional grade presentation. Uh, I have seen many TED talks and frankly, I'm a big fan of TED. I'm just only a fan of about 10% of the talks, frankly. and and. One of the reasons is, is that many of the TED Talks deliver very few IPMs. So in other words, you're watching a talk and you have to pull the content from the talk. The content isn't being pushed into your consciousness. People have watched my hindsight window talk and come up to me three years later and tell me the stories because it was engaging and informative. So I don't want there to be a, a choice. And, and to answer your question on how, well, how? Storytelling telling compelling stories, not reporting from above the stories, not going, well, I was doing this in the summer and then I did this in the fall. You go, no, it was a hot summer day. I threw the roof back on my car and I was just loving the tunes as I drove down the freeway. And then I came, not the freeway, the road, and I came to this set of traffic lights and this Neanderthal looking dude pulled up beside me. He's such a traffic bully. You just know the kind of guy and you drop into the story. That's how you do it. Great question. Another great question from Deborah. How long do you suggest it takes to be talk ready, so ready to deliver your talk um, after joining the SAM program? Well, um, I think there's a question of talk ready versus audience. So for example, when Tony Robbins office called me that time and said, would you come teach marketing and business at Tony Robbins seminar? I was not talk ready. I hadn't been on stage for three years. Luckily I had hours under my belt from before, but I knew this was a one-off opportunity that I absolutely had to take advantage of. And so I wasn't talk ready and I did it anyway. I don't recommend that for most people. If you got asked to do a Ted talk and you don't feel ready to do it, then what you really need is an advisor who can tell you you're ready to do it. Because frankly, most people will almost never feel ready to do it. So my, my view is this, you will be talk ready immediately. At, you, from this webinar, take what we did, design a talk and go and practice it at somewhere like Toastmasters and you're talk ready. Everybody is talk ready for Toastmasters. They're ready, that's where you start. But that's like starting with the go-karts, right? You start with a go-kart and then you move up to the, you know, to the, to the gas powered go-kart and then you move up to like the smaller race cars. And then one day you can race F1. And what I'm saying is you'll be ready for go-karts immediately. And over every single month, we'll be upgrading the level of the engine that you're capable of driving. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Next question is from Gavin. When you prepare your signature talk, do you first think of who your audience is and adapt to it? Or do you keep the talk the same? Absolutely, you adapt to the audience. Absolutely, you adapt to the audience. Um, not only do you adapt to the audience, but you may also adapt to the speakers that were at the event before you. I am a big fan of making sure that you watch the speakers that were there before you because it allows you to learn more about the audience and allows you to learn more about the, uh, um, uh, the energy of the room. And so, yes, I think it's important that you consider who the audience is. Great example, great, great example is, the icebreaker story that you tell in your F15, if I'm doing a talk in a personal development environment where I know there's a lot of, say, fans of Tony Robbins there, then I am almost always going to use my Lost in Translation story where instead of telling the audience that I sold my business after nine years, that I started my first, because it's really funny. The, the, way, the way it happened was is that I was supposed to be introduced by a Chinese um, um, uh, MC because the event was for largely Chinese people. And, and so Tony was supposed to walk up and say, I'm so excited about this next speaker. He started his first business 
um, and sold it nine years later. But instead, he goes up and he goes, I'm so excited about this next speaker. I just met him in the hallway. We had a fantastic talk. He started his first business nine years old, right? Like, it's super funny. Here's the kicker. If I'm doing that talk, and, I, and I'm doing that talk and I know that there's a, um, an audience there that's personal development themed or that, 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 that Tony Robbins would be popular with, I'm going to tell that version. Whereas if I'm doing a talk and I'm, I'm you know, in uh, you know, somewhere where there's uh, lots of pet lovers, I might tell that other one that I joked with you guys about earlier. So definitely I might craft the talks. In fact, there's an exercise we do at one of our intensive retreats where we have people develop their speech map on points only and then hand their speech map to the next person at the retreat and have them put their stories on the speech map. You begin to realize how flexible you can be as a speaker when you realize that you can change, you can use your existing speech map, but alter the stories subtly for the specific audience. Great question, Gavin. Hey, we have a question in regards, and I can answer this really quickly for you, Eric. Um, the next SAM call is on May 21st. So that's when the next SAM call will be. And as soon as you register, you actually get a downloadable PDF with all the SAM call dates and times. So you'll be all set to go. Um, so the next question is from Sherry or Sherry or Sherry, one or the other. It's C-H-E-R-I. <laughs> Do you tell the story first, then make a point? or the other way around, or sometimes both? Such a good question. Such a, such a good question. All right. So sometimes you tell a point. You go, look, you need it to be like this. And then you tell a story to prove your case, right? Then another way you do it is you tell a story and you want the audience to arrive at the point on their own, and then you point it out to them afterwards. This is a really important principle because often if you do, the first one can be useful in many cases, but sometimes the point is so subtle that if the audience doesn't realize it on their own, they'll never internalize it. In fact, if any of you are doing any coaching work or psychotherapy work or what have you, we all know that we can be talking to a client, know what the problem is, but if we tell them the problem, it won't heal anything. But if we let them wake up to the problem on their own, it has a huge transformative effect. And so sometimes you tell the story so that the point is subtly interlaced in the story and so they realize it on their own. Many of you will have heard me tell the story about barefoot running, you know, like going hunting with the Bushmen in Africa and learning about, and, and the point of the story that everybody gets is maybe they should consider using barefoot running shoes from time to time. But I don't say that, the story says it. And then I might say it at the end. But then there's the third version. And the third version is where you tell a longer story and it's got points embedded throughout it. Um, this is harder to demonstrate in the short time we've got here, but I'll give you an example that when I first, uh, when I was terrified of speaking, my father asked me to come and speak at an AA meeting. He wanted me to present him his uh, cake for, you know, so many years of sobriety and what have you. I'm not a member of AA, so I don't, didn't feel like I could speak at an AA meeting, you know, because you have to start off by saying, hi, my name's Eric and I'm an alcoholic and I'm not. So I didn't, I was all like in my head and scared and I didn't want to be there. And so I'm telling the story to people, but I'm using the story to teach important principles of speaking. So I, I go, so I went up on the stage and I was so scared. I was holding onto the podium and I'm supposed to introduce myself, but every single person is introducing themselves with, hi, my name is, and I'm an alcoholic and I'm not, and I don't know what to do. And suddenly I got this idea in my head of like the old courtroom dramas, you know, and I was standing there and I said, hi, my name's Eric and my father's the alcoholic. <laughs> and, and all room busted out laughing. And then I'd drop out of the story and I go, and the point of that is, is that if you can learn to trigger a quick laugh at the beginning of your talk, you calm yourself and the entire audience down and you open the door to taking additional humor risks because you've made them laugh. Okay, in any event, so then my dad came up, you know, so you know what I'm doing is I'm telling a story, nailing a point, ha hammering the point in and then continuing the story until the next teaching moment. Great question. Okay, we only have time for Three more quick questions. Um, okay. This one I can answer really quickly. Someone just wanted more information on the five day speaking academy. Um, you can find that at businessfreedom.com slash BFSA. And when you actually register for the SAM program, you'll, you'll be sent to a page that gives you your special link to get your 50% off offer. Um, so all the details you'll be finding are on there. And Eric, 
the next question that came in was in regards to Sam. Will we also learn, and this is from Nina, will we also learn strategies and tactics for the corporate world, for example, panel discussions and hosting events? Absolutely. Um, I, Nina, first of all, I want to tell you something about panel discussions right now. Don't do them. Now, I'm kidding. But now that you know, the reason I say that is because panels are highly unpredictable and difficult. Um, and we will absolutely be covering that stuff repeatedly during SAM because it comes up all the time. But I'm going to give you one piece of advice about panels that I really want you to get. Long before the panel takes place, you go and you have a conversation with the MC, with the, with the moderator, and with the other panelists. You get to know them a little bit. Really get to know them. And then you say this to them. Guys, I've been on panels before. Or if you haven't been on them, I've watched panels before. And what I've often seen is that everybody is like, trying to maximize their own time at the microphone. What I would like to know is what are your guys' specialties? Because if somebody asks me a question, I want to hand the microphone off to you sometimes because I think if they see us operating as a team, then it'll, the panel will look so much better. So go and have that conversation with the man, moderator and with the other panelists before the panel begins, and you're suddenly going to have a world-class panel experience other than just walking up and sitting in the chair like most people do. And yes, we absolutely will talk about speaking in corporate environments. There's also a lot of, many of the sessions are straight Q and A's with me. Like um, I can't remember when the next one is, but there's like a two hour straight Q and A session with me. And I've done just about every kind of speaking there is out there. So I'm, I, we will definitely be covering that topic. No question about it. Great question, Nina. Okay, the last question. So sorry, we're not able to answer all the questions, but the last one is from Tatiana. I really like this one. Can we mix different F15 and L15 strategies or should we stick to one for each? Oh no, you can mix them for sure. Uh, um, here's a great example. I talked about acknowledgements and big fat claims. I will often integrate them together. So I'll say, hey, I'm so glad that you guys are here. I know that many of you have flown. Uh, how many of you guys came from at least 5,000 miles away? Or at least I'll, I'll do some engagement acknowledging them. And then I'll say, and I know that some of you flew here because you knew you were going to get a lot of value. But I know some of you are sitting on the back row or on the aisle in case you feel like you need to escape. And so what I want you to know is you're not going to want to escape because this presentation is going to share with you strategies that you will remember and put in use immediately. In fact, if you do want to try to escape from this program, it's only because you're going to go and go take action on the things I'm sharing with you. So you see what's happened there is I've acknowledged them and also done the big fat claim. So yes, you can definitely kind of mix and match the strategies together. Jackie? Eric, that's time. <laughs> all right, guys. <laughs> Thank you all very much. It's been a real pleasure sharing these things with you. I do want to remind you of something. One of the challenges of our sense of self-belief is that it seems like we can only ever push our belief out just further than where we are right now. And I've got this exercise I want to offer you. I would love for you to think about your highest level of belief. Like what do you believe is really possible for you? And I want you to know that more than that is, but it's hard to see right away. And so what I'm gonna ask you to do is, right now I'm gonna ask you to imagine perfectly and you were able to achieve your highest goals at the moment. Like what would be a great goal for you to achieve as a speaker or as an author? But and then the exercise I want you to do is, I want you to recognize that if you achieve those things, do you think you'd have bigger goals, right? Like if you suddenly had a bestseller and you didn't have a bestseller before, do you think that having that bestseller would cause you to have bigger goals? And so here's the way I want you to set some goals around being a speaker. And then I want you to absolutely sign up. And it works like this. Imagine achieving three or four of your biggest business or speaking or writing goals relative to this topic. Then set goals from that imagination. If you want to speed up your manifestation velocity, this is one of the most important things that I can teach you, is push yourself, push your imagina imagination out to achieving some of the things that are at the limit of your sense of self-belief right now, and then get in that moment and set the next set of goals. Businessfreedom.com slash Sam, and I'll see you on the May call. It's been an absolute pleasure and a treat to share this with you all. Thank you very much. Have a fantastic week and goodbye.